Hello everyone, Prime here. Before, we've gone over the gods and goddesses in Smite with kits that didn't necessarily do their law any justice or even reference them at all. Of course, not every god in that video necessarily ignored their law, but for the most part, there were things in there that made the law not very pleased. Well, today we're going to be looking at the opposite side of the coin. Gods who really make the law proud to be part and associated with that god or goddess. And starting things up is Fenrir. His lines reference times at which Fenrir proved his might. Uh, this was the time in his lore where he was cared for by Tyr and was given trials and tests to please Odin's fears or to quell Odin's fears that Fenrir would one day break free and perhaps even kill Odin at Ragnarok. They wanted a way to bind Fenrir, so that was that. Also, his ultimate is a reference to the actual killing of Odin, and not just that, but the swallowing of the sun, the sky, and the contents of the earth, essentially. Other than that, the only major thing that references Fenrir's lore is the fact that he's a big scary wolf. And also, Fenrir's association with the runes, which you can see with his passive. Other than that, no, there's, there's nothing too bad about Fenrir, and other than that, Hyrus has just gone along with their own creative preferences. His one is also a nice throwback to him breaking free of his chains, uh, ushering in Ragnarok. So, yeah, Fenrir, very lore-abiding character. And following him, quite nicely, is Sun Wukong. His magic cudgel, or the as-you-wish gold-banded cudgel, fits the lore description quite well in the game, as his one allows it to extend to hit quite a far distance than you would expect from a cudgel, but also would then retract itself back to be a suitable size for Son Wukong to continue using as a weapon in the way that he did, or does in-game, rather. His 72 transformations may perhaps be inaccurate, because apparently he could transform infinitely, though this was probably post-Buddhahood, but there you go. 72 transformations, regardless. That's in the game, it does appease the lore. The only part of the kit that I can scrutinize is the Cloud Somersault, and that's because the Cloud Somersault was supposed to have Song Wukong leap several feet into the air, and in game he only leaps a tiny bit in comparison to, say, how much Thor or Ram or our Kwong would go into the sky. Sun Wukong could have easily jumped into those heights into the sky and it would be a bit more believable, but what we got is what we get, so there you go. And with the Cloud Somersault, he does also leave a clone behind, so that does reference Sun Wukong's ability to tear a piece of his hair out and then use that as a clone. And finally, his appearance is very acceptable. So, all of those things combined, and plus his passive, called Undefeated Body, just a reference to his lore being that while Sun Wukong was pretty unbeatable, his killstreaks are pretty sweet in the Chinese mythology, and speaking of killstreaks, his killstreaks lines also do reference how great he is and how unbeatable he is. So there's that. Following Sun Wukong, we have Apuash, with his themes of death, you know, he uses a lot of corpses and dead people and sort of Mayan curses in his kit. So, very strong themes of death. Apparently, the minds believed that Apwash was essentially meeting him, he'd have the greatest build-up, the scariest horror build-up, just a classic cliche horror build-up you could imagine. You're surrounded in mist, the atmosphere is very cold and dark and quiet, you may hear some crows breaking the silence in the background, and eventually Apwash will meet you face to face and kill you. And then you'll probably either A, be tortured for a fair, fairly long amount of time in the underworld, Shibalba, or B, be his plaything in another way and just be his minion or another one of his minions. He could do quite a lot to you if it was your time to die, if he just wanted to kill you. And following up a theme of death with another god who has quite strong ties to death, the Moriga. She has a bunch of lines referencing death and how much she's just so powerful and so so greatly linked to death. One of her jokes is that uh, she, she makes a reference to the fact that if she washes your clothes, you're pretty much dead. Uh, what she says specifically is this. So yeah. Also, the fact that her ultimate allows her to transform into pretty much any 
one that she wants is a pretty sweet reference to the fact that in her lore, before Cuculin's death, she took quite a few forms. She took the form of young lady, an older lady, a different lady entirely, because Cuculin apparently met the Morrigan whilst she was with another man and kind of shamed Cuculin a bit, like played around with him a bit, and Cuculin got pretty mad. But that's a story for another time. The last uh, thing that I'll mention that Hi-Rez included in there for the Morrigan is that they mention Barbed and Maka, who were two of the three aspects that make up the Morrigan. They don't mention the third one, I don't believe, but they may do. Might be wrong about that, but yeah, as far as I can remember, they don't mention who they're using as the third aspect, be that Nemean or the other goddess, but yes. Next up, we have a fairly simple one, and that's Mercury. His entire kit revolves around a theme of just him being super speedy, and him also being a bit playful and generally jolly. He was a trickster god, so the whole jolly nature, kind of playful stuff around his kit makes a lot of sense. And, of course, the big one. He was the messenger of the god, so him having abilities like fastest god alive and other such abilities just make a lot of sense for Mercury. Not too much to be said there, but yes. Next up, we have Skadi. Her skin was said to be as white as snow, and her hair matched this white aesthetic quite well. So, as far as the overall design of Skadi is concerned in Smite, very nice. Not quite as nice for the tier 1 skin or the other skins, but for the base model, very nice. As for Calder, she was said to perhaps have owl companions or wolf companion, any number of those. So Calder being there as a standalone character that Hyres has generated for the purposes of allowing Scarly to be in the game, very nice. Nice job, Hyres. That's just them interpreting the law and using as they see fit. She was also said to be gifted with having several abilities from Scarly skiing to being very dexterous in combat, and we can see that as she uses literal icicles crafted into spears, and then she throws those at enemies, and I'm sure it must take a pretty dexterous person to be able to use spears like that in battle constantly, so yes, that's a pretty nice reference. And of course her free, her allowing allowing her to skate across the ice on her free and giving her a speed boost even, showing her control and how well she is able to ski. Very nice reference to her ability to ski. So there's that. Finally, her ultimate and the fact that the cold doesn't bother her is just a nice reference to the fact that she was a frost giantess. And of course, Naturally, she would have had a fairly high tolerance for the cold, or perhaps even an immunity to feeling the negative effects that we do. Cold. Now for another short one. Capri recently did a lore video on him, so go ahead and check that out. Shameless plug-in for the win. He was said to be a beetle in some of his descriptions, and a giant beetle that was large enough to pull the sun across the sky. So Capri being having the largest character model in the game, considering that we know that the sun is far, far, far larger than the Earth, and we also know that the Earth is far, far, far larger than any one of us. Makes sense. But aside from that, in the lore video, I go on to say how the fact that he can revive himself, because he he is said to revive himself pretty much every day, so the fact that he has a revive in his kit makes sense. His association with having a lot of, like, solar abilities in his two and his three make a lot of sense. So... And also his references to the dawn and all the sun jokes. Just overall, Kepri, very low abiding character, I think. And next up, we have Aphrodite. She was a goddess of beauty and love. Um, and her in-game appearance, for the most part, suits that, I suppose. I mean, uh, let's be real here, Smite isn't exactly the prettiest game in the world, but, 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 that doesn't take too much away from Aphrodite's appearance. Also, her kit and the names of her skills reference this a lot as well. Kiss, it not only links you to an ally, but should you then try to kiss another enemy, that ally becomes jealous and gets a small damage buff. Undying Love makes Aphrodite and her soulmate immune to damage and CC immune for a short time. All of these things together should tell you, yes, Aphrodite has a pretty nice, pretty lore-abiding kit. So, very nice. Najar. Everything in his kit is a reference to his lore in some way or another. And notice that out of 
A lot of the Chinese gods typically have the most lore-abiding kits, though I could have picked a lot of Chinese gods uh, for this list, but Nijar is the last Chinese god that I've picked, and he was given the Universal Ring, Armillary Sash, the Fire-Tipped Spear, and the Wind Fire Wheels by a very wise and knowledgeable sage that taught him how to fight and taught him all of the values and decencies that he had. Of course, he still had his own personal righteous spirit, which is also his passive. So as you can see, Hyros really did use a lot, if not all, of Nijar's lore and kept that in mind when designing him and his kit. So, very nice job for Nijar. The last god that we have here, the tenth god, Osiris. He was the first Egyptian deity, perhaps, to be allowed to leave his mummy and live on in the afterlife. Also, the sickle and the flail were very important symbols to him, and were also just another sign of his of the fact that he was a king. And also, these are shown throughout his kit. Not only does he use these two tools as his main weapons in-game, but also some of his abilities. His one, he throws the sickle, it slows someone. His two, he strikes the ground with the sickle, it creates damage in a circle area. Nice reference to this. And he also has the mummy wraps for his three. So overall, yeah, so Cyrus's kit, very law-abiding, very nice. And of course, he turns into a ghost with his ult, Hopping back to the fact that he was able to leave his mummy. Just a nice all-round win for Hi-Rez there. Additionally, for extra bonus points for Hi-Rez, Osiris was said to have either black or green skin, and not only did they give Osiris green skin, but they also decided to make it a moldy green, just to hop in fact even further to the fact that Osiris was kind of a, a dying reborn god. And he's also covered in like mummy wraps and things like that, so yes, very, very, very nice job with Osiris, who's actually one of my, definitely my top three favorite warriors up there with Tyr and not really a warrior guy, so yeah, up there with Tyr. So yeah, tell me in the poll or the comment section below if you don't think I've mentioned the right gods that you think have the best, most law-friendly kits. Tell me which of these 10 gods you think is the most law-friendly kits in the comment section below and in the poll. Thank you for checking out the video. Leave a like if you did enjoy and want to see more videos like this. Subscribe to the channel if you're new here. And until the next video, I have been Prime. Have yourself a beautiful day, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.